Are you there? Hi, Jessica. Can you hear me? Hello, Jessica. I can't hear you. You might be on mute. I don't know. I can't hear anything. Oh, it says you're connecting to audio. I see. Is the connection bad in here? Okay. Can you hear me? I'm still muted. Is it working? But can Tom, can you see Tom? Because Tom is... Um... That's muted. Can you hear me at all? We can see you and we can. We're trying to work things out. I still can't hear Jessica quite yet. Oh, there you go. It looks like her IT department is on it, though. Now I'm dialed in. I'm echoing. All right, can you hear us here? Yes, just we can hear you. You're all set. Nothing yet. And you've so got much. 11 uh, attendees on. I'm trying to call in now. No, nothing yet. Can you not you hear us? On your screen I in can. the lower left. You can hear you can hear me. I can't hear you though. In the lower left, the mute isn't muted. Jessica, can you hear me? You want to log off and log back on? Yes. Um, it might be your AirPod issue. If you're not. I only know how to turn it off and turn it back on. Or Gina or Jennifer, is one of you there that might be able to help us out a little bit? Are you guys Yeah, listening Tom, now? we're both. We're both here and we are, we can hear you guys. We can hear both of you. But you can hear me when I talk? Yes. And Tom, we can hear you too. I can't hear, I can't hear you either. I can't. Oh, it looks like one of um, Vanessa says that that she can hear everyone. Yeah. One of our participants. So maybe it's my my computer. Oh, there it was me the whole time. Can you guys hear me? <laughs> okay, now I can hear. All of you. Tom, we can hear you. Okay, I'm. Can, uh, you guys can hear me when I'm. Can you hear me when I'm talking now? Yes. And it's yep. clear. Okay. Because I dialed in to use my earbuds, but I'll just speak out loud. Yep. No, you you sound great. I'm so sorry. I was my <laughs> keyboard was was what was on mute because I've been on these um, meetings all day long today. Sorry. <laughs> my my, my, my IT problem. <laughs> so. So, you so guys, thank you. you have, um, sorry. Go ahead, Tom. You got it. I just wanted to say um, thank everybody for joining us today for this um, CEU, the Legacy of Leather. Um, Jessica is kind enough to um, facilitate this, this CEU for everybody. If you want the points that go along with this, make sure that you email us or send us your email address. You can send it to me at um, hunter at tgshowroom.com and I can forward it on to Edelman for you if you like. Um, that would probably be the easiest um, easiest way to do it. 
and the other thing, if everybody, if you're not already following on Instagram, um, design.salvation, um, the design center would love for you to follow them. They are kind of blogging everything that's going on on our uh, market these uh, this week, and they're helping um, distribute gifts that are going along with each of the sessions that have been donated by our vendors. So if you guys want to um, uh, just make sure and follow them, that would be wonderful. Um, we are, I think, ready to get started. And it, I just want to say it is my pleasure to introduce Jessica McKeever. Um, she currently works with Edelman Leather out of New York City and has been in our industry for more than 12 years selling luxury fabrics, wall coverings, and leather. Um, today, Jessica is going to walk us through the Legacy of Leather CEU. So welcome to our screen, Jessica. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Okay, so I am going to share my screen. And let's just make this full panel. Okay, so this is the course information. Um, and Tom, if you can't hear me or if anything comes up, please just unmute yourself and interrupt me at any point in time. Um, and this is the class code. So once you send the email to us at the end, I can send you the certification um, or try to log in um, and get you guys the credit for this course. Uh, okay, so let's get started. So today we're gonna talk about the legacy of leather, um, how it's defined, how it's made, and lastly, how it's um, applied. So when we're talking about how leather is defined, we're talking about the environment, we're talking about full grain versus top grain, um, different characteristics of leather, different qualities and markings that um, hides can have. So we're gonna start off um, across the pond and speak to where leather comes from. So quality tanners, um, first and foremost, only accept hides that are a byproduct of the meat industry. So essentially we're recycling right at the get-go. Um, these, these animals are raised um, for their meat. So they are grass-fed in these beautiful pastoral lands with no growth hormones, um, only wooden fencing, and no branding of any type on these animals. So they're really raised in a very natural, um, absolutely beautiful environment. So they grow um, to be larger animals um, with very healthy hides. Um, leathers that are sourced out of South America, China, um, and even North America don't live in these kind of pastoral hills and aren't treated the same way, so the hides are of um, inferior quality. So when we talk about um, regions, it's kind of, I always say it's like a good wine um, or even good chocolate. It comes from a specific location for a reason. So Arzignano in Italy is famed for its tanneries for both fashion and interiors. Um, the highest quality tanneries will cater to both, um, you know, the leathers that we use in our homes and the leathers that we wear and use for accessories. Um, leathers that, basically Europe has the best of the best as with most things. Um, so things that are coming from South America are not gonna be as um, top notch as something from uh, specifically Italy. When we talk about how, um, leathers affect the environment, certification is really important, especially nowadays with sustainability um, and just more awareness in general. Um, Green Guard certifications are very stringent. Um, they have to do with indoor, indoor air quality. Um, and most high-end leather companies uh, that distribute here in the United States have at least a Green Guard, if not a Green Guard gold certificate. Um, you wanna look for the lead status and the US um, um, what is the other one? The oh, ISO. So those are what the tanneries are going to have to be compliant with. Um, extremely rigid, um, strict government laws going with all of these. So you want to keep an eye out for these sort of certifications um, when it comes to sourcing leathers. Uh, so as I mentioned, all of um, high quality leathers are going to be um, a by byproduct of the meat industry. So as long as people in the world are eating meat, um, there are gonna be hides that would otherwise be put into the ground. Um, so by using every part of the animal, we're eliminating waste. We also wanna talk about mindful selection. Um, so the 
where the animals are raised, the pastoral land, a lot of the farmlands, um, it's preserved land. So you're creating a life balance between the natural world um, and the grazing lands of the animals. Um, so it really kind of goes full circle where these animals are raised. Um, our tanning processes are mostly water based um, and they're done with minerals and um, very little, um, which are organic compounds and very little waste. Um, Leathers that are tanned naturally with vegetable tans are mostly extracts of tree bark. Um, and anything left over from that is gonna naturally just recycle back into the environment. Um, we're gonna go into detail about the different parts, different types of tanning. Um, chromium, which is natural to the environment, um, is used in a larger scale to tan our hides. And Anything that is pushed through with water has a purifying um, agent that goes through it. So anything we take out of the ground when we put it back in, we're making sure that it's pure and clean and not gonna harm the environment in any way. Um, we spoke about the very strict emission standards and meeting those certifications, uh, which is really important. And then lastly on this is that um, basically leather is gonna last is a lifetime um, until you get sick of it. So. In our environment now, we have a lot of kind of disposable clothing items. Um, you know, we're constantly redoing our homes, but a leather is gonna outlast a woven fabric um, for years to come. So you're also eliminating waste by not um, replacing, having to replace an item because it's worn out. So this is going to explain um, the difference between a full grain and a top grain leather. Essentially a full grain is the natural part of the hide. It hasn't been manipulated in any sort of way. Um, you can see just the top part that it's, um, that it's not gonna be sanded or, or rubbed down. It's not corrected or buffed in any way. Um, when you get to a top grain leather, those are leathers that have um, the surface because it's been corrected or enhanced, um, but essentially there was something on the top of the surface that wasn't perfect. So those leathers have been sanded clean and then a imprint of a leather pattern has been put on top or they're just heavily dyed to look like a natural leather when in fact they're not. Um, so a full grain leather is gonna have beautiful natural characteristics. It's gonna have wrinkles, it's gonna have grain, it's gonna have a beautiful sheen to it. Over time, it's gonna patina and wear in, um, and you're gonna have you know, this beautiful heirloom quality leather over time. Um, it's also gonna uh, absorb, so you're gonna stay warm and cozy in the winter, and it's gonna keep you cool in the summer. Essentially, a top grain leather is gonna be the complete opposite of that. You're gonna have um, kind of a polished look to it. It's gonna, over time, it can crack, it can split. Um, so I'm sure we've all seen those qualities, especially in like a tightly wrapped seat. Um, that's essentially not a full grain natural hide that has been, um, you know, kind of worn down and then it can't sustain. Um, so it cracks and splits. And this is an example of that. So here you have on the left, a beautiful, you can see that sheen, that patina. It does have a little bit of marking, a little bit of scratching. That's what gives it its natural characteristics. That's what makes it feel like your chair, you know where that scratch came from. Um, you know, it really kind of lives in your environment. Something that comes from a top green leather, leather is on the side. You're gonna have this kind of gross cracking, um, this splitting, this really looks kind of broken and just needs to, needs to be replaced. So you do wanna pay attention to top grain um, versus full grain when you're sourcing for any kind of leather project. Um, here's another example of that. It not, not necessarily um, has to completely split or crack open, but you get that crinkled kind of almost like spoiled look to it, um, but that's just not pretty. Um, and no one wants to sit on that after uh, a few years. Um, this is a great illustration. So this talks about the, um, what we refer to as the guide to the hide. So you can see, obviously, um, these come from natural, you know, from nature. So animals vary in size um, and the hides are always going to have some kind of irregular uh, outlines to them. So when we talk about a yield um, or usable area, you're kind of, you're talking about this indoor inside panel size. So on a full, uh, starting on the left hand side, chromium tanned cowhide, 
um, a large European cow is going to get you a panel size of about 65 uh, by 60 inches of usable area. A kip is um, essentially a, not a full grown um, cow, but not quite a calf. Uh, so you're going to get a medium sized panel um, from that with about 50 to 45 inches. And keeping in mind, these are obviously all averages. And then your calf hide, um, because they do eat veal um, a lot in Europe, especially, are 50 to 40 inches. Um, hair on hides and embossed leathers are going to have a split down the middle seam um, and you're going to have kind of like a long rectangular pattern. And we can talk later about the embossing because uh, the way the machine works, you'll have vertical plate lines going through. So anytime you're sourcing a leather, you do also want to pay attention to what type of leather it is. Is it a full cow hide? Is it a half hide? Is it a calf? Um, because if you're used, trying to use a calf skin and you're trying to apply it on a large sectional sofa, it's just not going to work. You're using a lot of, um, there's going to be a lot of extra waste and you're going to be purchasing a lot more um, versus using a full cow hide. Um, a shrunken cow hide has to do with uh, the tanning process. Sometimes it goes through an extra heat process and it causes the hide to actually shrink up. So your panel size will be a little bit smaller. And Swedes naturally come from a, or come from a different part of the animal. Um, so that panel size is always going to be smaller. And then a shearling is essentially a sheep, um, which is just a smaller animal. So your panel size is again, much smaller there. And a Mongolian shearling, these are usually, those are the long, um, you know, fuzzy kind of furs. And those are most likely stitched together. Um, so a lot of the companies, uh, high-end companies are gonna sell those as like a band or, um, you know, in just one big sewn stitch together pattern. You're not going to see it from the front. Um, so you do want to kind of pay attention when you're sourcing for those as well. And then next we're going to talk about is yields. So when I talked about that setting at that panel, um, you know, all of the hides that are selected are of the highest quality, but these animals, you know, are, they still are out in a field. So they can have, um, you know, natural markings and unnatural markings to them. So within that panel size, as long as it is 75 to 90 or 75 to 100% clear, you're going to get an A grade. So the majority of the panel is crystal clear. There might be a little imperfection here and there. Natural characteristics, natural markings, you're going to have an A quality grade hide there. Um, a B grade is going to have, you know, a little bit more markings, um, maybe some slight larger imperfections, especially out in the unusable areas. And then a C grade is going to have a lot of imperfections, um, including in you know, areas where you're not going to have a clean, clear panel. So this doesn't necessarily mean that these are um, lower grade hides. They're still you know, European full cow hides. It's just that you don't have a crystal clear center panel. But this is where these hides are going to be sold for shoes and purses and belts and different parts of um, you know, smaller panels uh, in the industry. There are even certain companies that are purchasing for, um, for handles and knobs and just smaller cut pieces. Um, and you always do want to ask when you're sourcing, if you're doing bar stools and, you know, something where you know you need what your panel size is, you should always give that to whoever you're working with because um, they can actually go and measure it out. Um, you can see panel A, the top right corner, you, get, you could get a really big, nice square out of there. Um, and that little imperfection might not even be noticeable. So, um, you know, just always voice what your project is and what you're looking for. And I'm sure whoever your salesperson is at whatever company you're working with um, would be able to help you on those. And next we are gonna talk about um, tanning. So there are two types of tanning. Um, tanning is essentially the art of preserving the hide. Um, and you can either tan with chromium or with vegetable tan. Uh, we are gonna start talking about chromium tanning. Um, it's the most common way to tan a leather these days. It's done for larger um, groupings of hides. It's much faster um, and kind of just more commercialized. Uh, leather responds really well to chromium. It creates a very soft, lightweight, um, you know, hide and it helps the hide absorb the color very well. Um, and when we talk about chromium, we're talking about chromium three. A lot of people hear chromium and they think it's some kind of scary, crazy material, um, but it actually occurs naturally in our environment. It's found in rocks, soil, um, volcanic material, 
and um, it's actually even in our bodies to help us metabolize, metabolize fats and sugars. So when we're talking about chromium-3, it's natural to the environment and it doesn't harm the environment going back into it. Um, I think chromium-4 is the scary stuff, but just completely something different. And that is absolutely not used with the strict standards um, that these tanners have to use. Um, so yeah, it occurs naturally in our environment. It has a, a light blue kind of color to it. So you'll see if you see a cleaned, raw, just tanned hide, they always kind of what they refer to as a wet blue uh, stage in color. I'll show you some pictures of that later on. Um, so that's what it is. That's where it's from. Um, so vegetable tanning. So vegetable tanning is actually the oldest process. It's over a thousand years old. It really hasn't changed much. Um, it's usually done in oak barrels with natural uh, bark and tree extracts and uh, things that you find in the environment. It's a longer process. It's done in smaller batches and it does give you a completely different feel. So um, you can even kind of see in the center photo here that uh, look here, it's gonna be much more rigid. You get that stiff, uh, thicker, kind of hardier, smooth feel to it versus a leather that's gonna be really soft and pliable, which would have been a chromium tan leather. Um, we also use vegetable tan leathers for our embossing because they are thick um, and smooth. It's great for either if companies use a roller or in our case, we use, um, you know, hot um, kind of stamped press to it. But it's going to it's going to maintain that embossing much better because it's such a stiff, hardier uh, hand to it. Um, so any good embossing is going to be done on a vegetable tan leather. So you want to keep that in mind as well. And then moving forward, so we have our chromium tan leather and our vegetable tan leather. And from those two different tanning process, you can actually have three different um, kind of types of leather. So we have an, I guess we can start with aniline leather. So these are our pure top grain leathers that have not been manipulated in any way. And really the only thing you're doing to these are tanning them or preserving them. And then you are adding some light color to it. So these are gonna have um, very natural looks to them. You're gonna see wrinkles and marks. You're gonna, um, over time, you know, these can, are gonna wet, react to their environment. They're gonna wear in. You're gonna get, um, you know, beautiful lines. You can see some markings, some scratches and some stains. Um, some of those things can be rubbed out, but you're gonna have a true, pure, natural uh, leather there. So it all kind of depends on what the look um, that your client is going for. I always say people tend to use aniline for more rustic environments, um, but you know, you know it's the highest quality. You know it's, it's in its purest state. It's gonna last for a lifetime and it's just gonna be truly beautiful in the space. So we do wanna make sure the client understands um, what a pure aniline entails. Now, semi-aniline is kind of the best of both worlds. You're taking your pure aniline leather. Um, you once again haven't manipulated it. It's super strong and durable. It has all its natural wrinkles and beautiful lines to it. But you're adding a pigmented dye, which is going to spread across the hide in a more uniform color. Um, it also is going to make it resistant to wear, resistant to light fading, and resistant to stain. Um, so these are kind of where we live these days, especially when we're using these in hospitality, contract, offices, um, even private homes where people have five children, especially nowadays, and you're always home, um, and you want to use a light-colored leather, semi-aniline is a great way to go. A lot of these can actually also be occasionally cleaned with bleach. Um, obviously, bleach is a very harsh chemical, so we don't want to be continually using it on our leathers, but it can be. Um, and then there are companies that sell leather cleansers and disinfectants too. So um, if anyone's interested in that information, I can also um, uh, you know, send that along in an email because it's not all included in here. Um, so, okay, so semi aniline leathers, they um, yeah, are really durable, beautiful pigmented dyes. And these are also really good for custom coloring. So if you're looking for a color or your client, you know, is doing, I mean, we've done like lavender rooms and everything has to be the perfect shade, you know, 20% gray. Um, Semi-anilins are gonna take that color extremely well. So um, if you don't always see a color in a collection that you're looking for, you should definitely ask for it. It's very easily do. A lot of them are done through a computer system. Um, so you're getting a very exact match. 
Um, so yeah, semi-anilines are good for custom coloring. And then we can talk about hand finishing. So um, hand finishing essentially is a semi-aniline leather then goes through another step where someone or you know mechanical process is adding an artisanal um, finish to the hide. We're gonna go into a few more of those in, in detail later. So I won't stay on that for too long. Um, okay, so we talked about anilines and pure anilines. Um, we talked, okay, so we started with chromium and vegetable tanning. Then we have our anilines, our semi anilines, and our hand finished leathers. And then we're going to talk now about the actual grain structure of these. So you have, I, in my opinion, I think it's really kind of more a few three classifications, but we have five across here, so we'll just go through them. But um, a smooth leather starting on the left is going to be something like this, just completely flat, smooth, clean, um, nice, supple hand, just really beautiful. I'm trying to show you the white so that you guys can really see. And then the next one is going to be um, just a little, a little hint of a, um, you know, a texture on there. And then you're going to have an actual, I hope you guys can see these, uh, pebbled look to it. And then there are some hardier kind of grainy, heavy um, textures here. And then something that's going to be embossed onto the leather. So repeating pattern, kind of more consistent looking pattern. So different types there. So also keeping in mind when you're shopping for your client, um, this is always a question that we ask right away. Like, what's the environment? What are they looking for? And what type of leather? Do they want something smooth? Do they want something textured? Do you want to walk in and across the room, you know it's leather because you can see the grain. Um, so it also just depends on what you're putting it on and the look that you're going for. But it is, the grain structure is something to keep in mind um, when you're shopping. So for quality, we want to talk about natural characteristics that happen in the environment in a, um, you know, that, that aren't considered imperfections, which are hair follicles. Hair, hair, hair follicles in this picture, you can't really see. Um, you really actually can only see them in light, light hides up close if you really know what you're looking for. Um, but it is something that shows that the leather hasn't been sanded or manipulated anyway. So it's kind of like a little hidden test to know if you're using a good um, full grain leather. Um, veins occur naturally, obviously, we all have them. So um, they're not considered an imperfection unless they are, um, you know, there's a lot of them spread across our usable square footage. Um, then it would be considered something that might lower it down to a B or a C grade. Um, but for the most part, you're gonna see a little natural vein. You're gonna see natural wrinkles. Um, neck wrinkles are especially at the top of a hide. They always go, they'll move in the same direction of the hide. This is the characteristic that shows that this hide has not been sanded, it hasn't been buffed, it is in its natural, purest, most durable state. Um, so wrinkles are a good thing. Um, and we want to embrace that beauty. You want to embrace that quality and you want to explain what that means. Um, a lot of clients nowadays are used to woven fabrics where everything is picture perfect and completely smooth. Um, but a wrinkle truly shows that you know you have the highest quality um, untouched hide there. What we don't like to see are things like healed scars. Um, obviously, this is a very slight one, and it's hard to show it on screen, but a rough area. So rough areas and hide uh, healed scars, um, when hides are first tanned, um, there's inspection across you know, all the stages of tanning. Um, but these are kind of like hidden and you can't always see them. So as we add dye to them, as we, um, you know, finish the hide, we'll come across these. And this is something across the finishing line that might make, um, you know, the hide that was selected uh, not be a true, um, you know, top quality. Hides of something like this might be passed over, um, you know, to the fashion industry where they can use smaller areas. Also, imperfections are going to be black specks or dirt. This is done from essentially a tannery that is rushing the process, that in between they haven't cleaned their spray guns. Um, you know, it's just kind of sloppy work. So you definitely don't, um, you know, that's considered a flaw for sure. And then farm branding. Um, unfortunately, a lot of the farms in South America and even here in the United States still brand animals. Um, 
barbaric process and obviously leaves a very unsightly mark. So we would consider that an inferior quality hide. And a crease is once again, another imperfection. So a crease basically means that the hide wasn't when it was in a drying process or um, you know, while it's being colored, it wasn't properly stored and then it creased and wrinkled and you're never gonna get that out. It's gonna be a permanent um, mark on there. So it's just, once again, showing that uh, extra care wasn't given to the hide. Insect bites and parasite holes, um, you know, are again, are a factor of the animal's care. So if there's a lot of these across the hide, you know that this animal wasn't properly cared for and it's most likely not coming from um, somewhere in Europe. Um, so we kind of use this chart. We talk about the tanning um, hand of a, um, of a hide. So you're gonna have that chromium, that really soft, pliable hand versus a vegetable tan, which is gonna have a stiffer hand to it. Um, the finish and the color. Do you want it to be protected? Do you want it to be natural? Do you want it to be protected, but look like it's natural? And then the grain structure. Do you want a smooth leather all the way to something super hardy um, or something embossed? So these all help us manage our client expectations when we're working on a project. These three factors when it comes to leather um, should always be asked. Um, when you have, when you know what your client's expectation are, it makes it much easier to shop for different projects. Um, okay, so moving onward. So next we're gonna talk about um, how leather is made. Okay, so this uh, picture here is actually of a modern tannery in Arzignano where we were talking about earlier. Um, and it just goes to show from the outside, you would have absolutely no idea what's going inside of this building. Um, there's lots of windows, there's lots of open air. Um, it's very clean, um, you know, it's, it's a beautiful building. This is what goes into actually tanning all the hides. So we're not going to go through all of it, I promise. I'm not going to bore you guys to death. But um, just to show you the full process is very, it, you know, there's a lot to it. Um, and a lot of these tanneries are fifth and sixth generation. They've been doing this for years. Um, you know, it's come down to a science and um, you're really getting a lot for your money. Um, so rest assured there. This shows raw material in its wet blue stage. Um, some of them hanging to dry, them stacked up, ready to go. Um, there's a lot of different terminologies here, but we can just go through. Essentially, this is the beginning part of the process where the hides are essentially cleaned. Um, and then these big clear tubs, you can see it's water. It's, you know, it looks like the inside of a washing machine, but not a lot of heavy detergents and, um, you know, harsh chemicals. This is um, the big chromium drum. So you can see this pure size of these. I don't know if you ever stood next to a full size hide. Um, I mean, if you were standing at the foot of this, your head would barely come to the bottom of these drums. So when we talked about using chromium to do larger scales, larger scale um, tanning, you get a lot done in these um, quite quickly. So, you know, it's just a, a way of um, producing products for, the New Yorkers who want it the next day. It's like what I like to say. <laughs> um, okay, so that's the wet blue. And then let's see, what else do we have here? So this is the wet blue. Um, this is showing some of the samples. So some of the smaller um, drums that can be used to, um, you know, when they're working on new colors or new processes and they, or sampling, um, these are smaller drums that can be used. And these are the hides coming out of a wet blue stage. So they're just laid out, they're clean, they're pristine, they're, they're gonna be inspected, and then they're gonna be, it's gonna determine where they're gonna go next. Um, this is what inspection looks like. It's usually two to four people standing around inch by inch going over the hide um, to see you know, what the usable panel size is, if it's best for, the interiors industry, if it's best for the fashion industry, um, you know, where it's gonna go next. Um, shaving is done to, um, you know, prepare the hide. Thickness is an important characteristic when you're, you know, subdividing the leather. So obviously a shoe or a handbag, um, you know, are gonna use a thicker leather or, you know, if, if for interiors we use it with belting and things like that. So shaving the leathers, um, you know, it's going to help subdivide it into the different characters to get it, or different areas to get it ready for what it's uh, going to be best for. 
Um, so these are different drums that show um, can, um, dyeing and fat liquoring. I know that's a terrible word, but essentially when the, when the hide is cleaned, it loses some of its natural um, oils. So fat liquoring, it goes into an emulsion of oils and grease and it basically lubricates the fibers. It makes them super soft and supple and it helps the leathers from drying out. It keeps them um, you know, ready to accept dye and to be used in um, our home furnishings. Um, yeah, those are those three bins or things there. And then these are some smaller drums once again. So you're always gonna have larger scale drums and you have smaller scale drums um, for sampling. This is um, this process is called samming. So once you basically add the oil and the grease to the leather, it's then uh, the excess is removed. So it goes through these hot rollers and um, you know, it helps absorb all the excess so that the leather has just what it needs. It maintains it so that it can stay supple and beautiful and all the extra is um, taken off. And then we can talk about drying. So, I mean, back in the day, they didn't have these huge industrial machines. So hides were hung um, either over a horse or, you know, hung like a clothesline and they're rotated. And it, this process is still used today, just not, at, you know, as on that large of a scale. Um, you can also, the machine on the left is essentially a big oven. The hides are laid, hides are flat on the belts. They go through, it's a warm heated environment. It takes out all the moisture and they come in on the other end dry. Um, and then there's also a machine that essentially does the exact same thing, but it's more of a vacuum press. So the hides are put on, um, a top comes down, all the moisture is you know, sucked out of the hides so that it dries very quickly. Um, so that is what these show here. So yeah, just different processes you can see. Um, I think what's amazing about this picture is how clean this and sterile this uh, tannery is. I mean, it looks like a hospital. It's just absolutely pristine, it's bright. Um, you know, it's filled with light and air. It's not some grimy, dirty um, facility. And uh, everything is pretty much computerized these days too. So it's very efficient um, in the process as well. This just shows another uh, part of the drying machine where they're rolled on the end and stuck back in if they're still wet. Um, ah, this is the deep tissue massage. So we, um, when you wanna get the leather a bit more soft and pliable, um, it goes through it with, it's called the stocking press, uh, stocking process. And essentially it literally is just kind of um, massaged to kind of loosen the hide and make it nice and soft. Okay, next is color. So these machines here, um, you know, it's once again, it's, it's very much like a paint factory. It's all computerized. It comes down to a science, this much blue, this much yellow, this much green. Um, Certain tanneries have their you know, own formulas. And then there's also, of course, you know, standard colors if you're trying to match to a Pantone or a Benjamin Moore. Um, everything has a code, everything is you know, scientifically done. Um, you do wanna keep in mind that we are dyeing natural materials. So there can be slight variations. Obviously this is why we use strike offs and CFAs in our industry. Um, but for the most part, it is done to an exact science. So you really should be getting you know, the color that you're that you're choosing. Um, you know, it's a very clean and very exact, well-organized process as you can see here. And this is just another, uh, more pictures of the dyeing process um, for the larger hides. Um, those Italians are very organized. Um, so yep, this is just the machine showing the color going in um, and another on the, on the right showing some artisanal color. So, you know, even though there is a scientific factor once the color is created, um, you know, these tanners are have been, like I said, doing this for generations and they will, you know, use their own natural inherited talents to create new colors. Um, so this shows it does have a human element to it here as well. And strike offs are always going to be um, available when it comes to dyeing. So, you know, this is just a small sample. The edge of the hide has been cut and the color is being applied so that it can be sent um, over to us here in the States and the color can be approved to um, move forward with the dyeing of all the hides. 
And this is once again what a finishing line would look like. Um, so here you see the hides are laid out. They're nice and clean um, on those horses. They're dried. Um, the environment itself is very clean. Everything is um, really pristine here. And this just shows another example of the other side of the machines, the finishing line. Ah, here are our spray guns. Um, so these are used, uh, color can basically, you can either completely submerge a hide, um, you know, in a color bath to absorb color. Otherwise it can be sprayed on. Um, so these are, you know, they show inside what the sprayer looks like. And then these would have to come out. They would be, the entire thing would be cleaned completely um, when you're switching to a new color. And if that care isn't taken, um, you're gonna have those marks like we talked about earlier in those other slides. And this is it just coming out of the end of the machine. So once again, it's going through a human inspection. You know, these hides have all been dyed. Um, so they're making sure that inch by inch as it moves along, that there's no imperfections, no you know flaws that weren't noticed before. Okay. Um, so next we're going to talk about um, milling. So milling is has to do um, where the hides are softened and a grain, the grain of it can be enhanced. So it goes into these drums, it goes through like a water and heat and drying process, and that's going to bring out your like super hardy hide um, grains that you have here, something like this. So it's, it's a heat dry process. Um, it can either be done, modern tanneries like this is gonna use a steel drum. Um, older tanneries are still gonna use a wood drum, which obviously would create more of an authentic look and it's gonna take a longer time. Um, but that's what this, the next process is. And then embossing. So this shows an embossing machine. It's essentially the leather is fed in, it's a half hide. You can clearly see the machine's not wide enough to fit a full hide. And then it's a hot pressed, um, you know, heat stamp basically that comes down to emboss the leather. So if these are done on vegetable tan leathers, what they should be, you're never gonna have it pulling or stretching out. Sometimes you can see on embossed leathers on a lesser quality or something that goes through um, like a top green leather that's been sanded and then they take a hot roller and put it on, you know, over it. I'm trying to create an authentic look. If you try to wrap that on a tight corner, you're going to lose that embossing. It's going to stretch out. So you're going to know right then if you're looking at it that it's not the highest quality, that it's a hide that was, you know, had some slight imperfections and that they were trying to basically cover it up with an embossing. Um, so you, once again, do you want to look for vegetable tan leathers for your embossing? Um, okay. And then hand finishing. So hand finishing can be done through a machine, um, you know, an extra layer or, um, you know, some kind of metallic finish or something can be done um, to the hides on the left. And then on the right, you have truly an artisanal, talented person who is going to stand there and put layer and layer and layer on layer of color, um, you know, dark upon light, usually to make it look and feel like something, um, you know, that's been around for centuries. So when you're dealing with hand finishes, even though you're doing within the same dye lot, they're taking these individual hides and, you know, adding color to them one at a time. So if you're doing a huge sectional with a hand finished leather, you're going to get three or four hides in the same dye lot. But because, you know, you have human standing there doing it, you're going to have some of them be darker, some of them be lighter. So you do want to keep that in mind. Um, you know, if you're using a hand finish hide and you need multiple for projects. I personally think it looks absolutely gorgeous when you're, they're all mixed together, you really get this beautiful um, kind of ombre of color and it, it can really look quite amazing. So don't be afraid of it either. Um, so here it shows one of the hand finishing lines. Um, these women in these pictures are, um, you know, putting the color onto the hides um, creating kind of a modeled or marbled antiqued look, however you want to phrase it. Um, you know, and, and pretty much every leather company out there has some type of hand finishing like this, which is uh, quite popular. Um, the other type of hand finishing is going to be um, tipping and wipe off. 
So essentially tipping is when the, on the left-hand side, the high has been dyed kind of that light gray color. Um, you know, it's usually lighter. And then the peaks or the tips either have a metallic or a darker um, you know, color or quality to enhance uh, that part of the hide. Wipe off on the right hand side is a process where the color um, that the base is darker. So you apply the darker color and then it's wiped off. So the tips or the peaks become lighter. Both of these create beautiful depth um, and they really allow you to kind of play with color. So you can custom color these to be, um, you know, whatever fits into your project. Um, and it doesn't, like I said, doesn't have to talk necessarily be two colors. You can do it with a metallic quality. Um, I know, for instance, I've worked on projects where you've done black with a black metallic or white with a white metallic. Um, just kind of gives an extra depth without adding more color into a scheme. Um, and then this is ironing. So when we want to add um, extra sheen to a leather, uh, a heat process is used. It goes basically through this hot roller and you can see Picture's a little bit grainy, but on the left, it goes in pretty flat. And on the right, it comes out um, with a beautiful deep sheen to it. And then once again, we go through another final inspection. Um, so some imperfections, if there were any kind of mistakes with coloring um, or anything that didn't come out properly um, are gonna be noticed here. And then if it's not good for interiors, it could be passed over to a different industry. Um, but the inspection process is quite thorough. It's involved in every aspect of, um, you know, tanning and coloring the leather. Um, so a lot of human effort goes into here, into um, tanning these hides. Um, okay, and then I think we have measuring. Okay, so this is a measuring machine. The hide goes in. You measure the entire hide, um, which gives you, you know, an overall general idea of what your usable square feet are going to be. Um, leather is always sold by the square foot. Uh, we say 18 square feet equals one yard of fabric. Um, but you do want to keep in mind there are irregular edges to every single hide. So it really always just depends on your project. Um, you know, always see what you're using it for. We, I mean, you know, we've done long skinny wrapped panels where, you know, you're working on a diagonal. So, um, you know, giving, providing a panel size, if you're working on some kind of bar stool, um, you know, it really helps when you're selecting or sourcing your leather for certain projects. Okay. And now we can talk about how leather is applied. Okay, so what do we have here? Um, oh, this is, um, they're showing the, you know, the leather being laid out, um, it, you know, how you would measure it depending on what you're putting it on. Um, and um, you know them cutting and getting ready to work with it. Um, this top left corner shows the leather um, being stitched, and then um, the two bottom pictures show skiving. Um, so skiving can be done by hand, um, but it has to be done by someone who knows what they're doing, um, or it's done with a machine. And essentially, skiving is just thinning out the leather. So we do this a lot if you're doing um, wrapped handles or buttons or um, you know certain little accessories, tie backs on a chair, things like that. Um, the upholsterer who's working with the leather, um, you know, either does this or the company that is selling the leather. A lot of them also offer it. Um, so yeah, it just thins it out, making it more pliable and usable for specific projects. Um, and then this just shows some different uh, pieces and the way we can apply um, our leather to them. So, you know, we have a beautiful patina leather on the left, um, a really beautiful shearling in the middle, solid on the end. Um, this is, you know, just showing some more modern applications. You have channel tufted, you can have it applied to the walls. Um, leathers can be quilted. So. Really your imagination is kind of your best friend when it comes to leather. You can use it in a variety of different ways, um, you know, across every different type of project. Um, here shows, you know, this gorgeous hair on hide and beautiful hot pink. Um, and then you have a mix of suede and a cowhide leather on the left. And then we're showing a jumbo croc patterned embossing on the right. Um, so lots of different patterns, textures, color, 
you know, don't be afraid to, um, you know, let, mix and match as well. Um, you can put on round ottomans, squares, uh, tufted pieces, and then again on hard finishes. So a lot of leather is applied to um, tables. Uh, as you can see here, it's a direct glue application. Uh, the leather is usually skipped or thinned out. And then um, a lot of times we're doing textures on here, a lot of embossing, especially with the chagrin, that's quite popular. Um, this shows, you know, the, the leather completely wrapped around even the legs of the table. Here we have, like I said, the chagrin inlaid in a doorway and um, different embosses wrapped around handlebars. So these type of textures can, even though this is very slight, you know, it, it does add a lot of um, depth and characteristics to your project. So, um, and you really don't need a lot of it. So it's, um, it's a great enhancement. Uh, leather wrapped mirrors are becoming really quite popular. And these you can do, you know, custom sizes and obviously um, pretty much anything there. Um, and soft finishes, pillows, especially with the, the um, hair on hides are quite popular. And then there's obviously all kinds of throws and trims. Not everyone thinks for leather companies for trims, but the little welting really does make a beautiful um, little addition to projects as well. And then floors and walls. So I don't really, I don't think I have a picture of it. It might come up later on, but you can, um, did you have a question, Tom? Oh, no, no question. Oh, okay, sorry, you just popped we, up for some reason, okay. <laughs> oh, we just, we just um, have a few minutes left before the, the design center has to start the next um, okay. presentation. I think I only have like two slides. So awesome. um, yeah, I'll just talk as we're moving through it. So um, leather can be, leather tiles can be applied directly to walls, ceilings, floors. Um, you know, they create beautiful depth and warmth. And they can also be wrapped around panels. And then those panels can be used with a Z clip to attach to the walls. So when we think of leather, a lot of times we think of it just for upholstery. Um, here we have it in this beautiful star spiral staircase, um, you know, in offices and elevators. So there's lots of applications for that. Um, hair on hide is also another um, beautiful part of, of what a lot of companies are doing. You can have full hides, you can have them cut and patch work together. Um, they can be applied to walls, floors, um, even as drapery. You have the suede with the matching sheer on the right-hand side. Um, so don't be afraid to think outside the box when it comes to these applications. Um, a lot of the time, this paneling you can see here on the elevator, um, you know, it creates a really nice, soft, plush-looking wall. Um, and those can be done with like a peg system. It can be done with a Z-clip system. So if anyone wants more information when it comes to floors and wall application, please feel free to reach out. Um, we do, we have a lot of experience with it and we have a lot of information on it. Um, and then this just shows some typical applications here. We have residential, um, obviously in workplace environments, um, hospitality, um, like we said, those semi anilins those protected leathers um, that can be custom colored to you know, work in any kind of environment here um, and retail. Um, the red room on the left, the rustic dressing room on the right, um, and you can add nail heads, perforations, um, really whatever you envision. It, it, you know, leather is very workable, very pliable, um, and can be, you know, pretty much used anywhere, including custom aviation. Um, and a lot of leathers are IMO certified, so I don't know how many people are working on yacht projects, but we do do them, and that is available as well. Um, and this is a great example of a custom automobile. Um, and motor coaches. A lot of people, especially now, coronavirus, want to get out but don't want to travel. Um, this is, a, you know, part of the industry that's sneaking up on us. Um, and uh, is, you know, great application for leathers. And that is the end. So if anyone has any questions, I'll give you a moment. Um, otherwise, please feel free to reach out. Um, Tom has the email so I can get you guys the credit. And then if anyone wants further information or needs help with any specific projects, I'm happy to help in uh, there as well. I can't see, here we go. I don't see any questions coming up. 
I, I would just want to say, Jessica, thank you so much for um, performing the CEU for us today. And I just wanted to remind everybody again, if you want the credits for the CEU, shoot me an email, hunter at tgshowroom.com, and I'll get your contact information over to Jessica, because um, we would love to get you the, the CEU points if you want them. Yes. Um, and thank you so much for being here today. Yes, thank you everyone. I hope you found it informative. Um, and like I said, just reach out if you have any questions. All right, thank you very much, Jessica. Of course. All right, take care, have a good day. Bye. Bye.